Hey church, as we prepare for the sermon, we wanted to take a minute to remind you about the different ways to participate in tithing giving. If you want to give online, there will be a link appearing in the chat. If you click on that, it will take you to our giving platform where you can give or set up a recurring gift. Another option would be to head to churchonmain.net slash give where it will take you to our website and you can give there. Now as we prepare for the sermon, let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to gather online. We pray for our tithe and our offering, that you would continue to bless it, that you would bless us as we continue to do your work. Father, we pray for the sermon this morning, that you would continue to teach us something new, that we would walk away with a way to apply it to our lives, and that we look for a way to impact our community around us. Father, we love you this morning, and thank you again. Let me pray. Amen. Thanks for being here. We're continuing in our study of Mark. Mark chapter 5, and so if you've got that, go ahead and turn there. And um, man, you're going to notice it is a big passage. It's 20 verses, and um, we're going to go through it. If you're a guest, my name's Brian, and uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm the pastor, and we're going, we go through uh, verse by verse, word by word, bit by bit through the Bible to get a better understanding of what it means. And so you'll see in front of us today is a, uh, a difficult passage, but more than that, a long passage, 20 verses. So uh, don't be alarmed. I, it is important though. Um, we've got to take this all in one message. I mean, it was written as one message. It was written to be kept together. And so um, it's just important for us to understand to take it as it was written when it was breathed out by the Spirit of God. And so we're going to go through all 20 verses. It'll be fun. We'll learn a lot and um, invite you to go with me through it. So verse one, I'm going to read just a few verses and then I'll pray and get into the message. And um, we did, we got through all 20 verses in the first service. And so we're going to be able to do it. Verse one says this, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him and he had his dwelling among the tombs and no one was able to bind him anymore even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one, no one was strong enough to subdue him. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you, and we're grateful for this moment. God, we're grateful that in your sovereignty, in your power, by your mercy, by your grace, you have extended our lives to this moment. And so Father, it was your will that we would be gathered in this room at this moment. And so Father, we have gathered and we've sung songs and we've prayed, we've seen baptisms. Father, we're reminded that you're working in the lives of people. And now, Lord, we come to this passage, and so we're asking that you would speak to us through it. Father, I pray that you would speak through me, your broken vessel, to explain and to teach. God, help me to, help me to teach with clarity uh, what this passage is about. And so, Father, where there is confusion, that's on me. That's not your word, Lord. We believe your word is true. It's perfect. It's without error. And we're grateful to be able to have a copy of it. So Lord, whatever it is that we bring in here, whatever fears or doubts or frustrations, Father, I pray that in this moment, in this time while we're gathered, that we would feel and hear you speaking to us through your word. And that's what we ask. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all can be seated. So if you were not with us last week, it's important to be reminded or to understand the context and what happened last week. And so very simply, in the previous passage, right before this passage that we're in today, it's the passage that so many people are familiar with. It's where Jesus got in the boat, was crossing the Sea of Galilee, and a big storm broke up. Remember that? A big storm stirred up, and the apostles were there. Jesus was sleeping. They go over. They wake up Jesus. They get kind of sarcastic and smart alecky with him. They get rude and disrespectful with him. And they're like, you don't even care. You're sleeping even though this big storm is brewing. And so Jesus gets up and he shows his ability, his power, his authority. And with a few words, he calms the storm. In fact, it was two words translated into three words in our language. And he tells the storm to be still. And so the passage ends with the apostles 
They had been scared of the storm because it was destroying the ship. It was so bad. But they become terrified of Jesus when he calms the storm. And if you recall, the passage in the previous passage ended with the question, who then is this man that even the wind and sea obey him? This passage picks up immediately because this is what happened as they got through the storm and got to the uh, Sea of Galilee and, or got to the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And now the Spirit of God is like going even deeper to answer that same question. You want to know who this man is? And he gives us next passage. So that picks us up right where we are. Verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. Now, Matthew talks about this event. So does Mark, obviously, here. And so does Luke. But you'll see it referred to differently by each writer. Uh, Mark refers to it as the country of the Gerasenes. Another writer refers to it as the Gergesenes. Um, They give three different ways to refer to the area of where this happened. Now, Bible critics will say, see, you can't trust the Bible. Three different writers refer to three different locations. It's not what's happening. It's the same thing. It'd be like if I'm in another country and someone asks me where I'm from, say I'm in Kenya. And they ask me where I'm from, and I say, well, I'm from America. And then another person says, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Georgia. And another person says, where are you from? And I say, I'm from Monroe. Well, I didn't lie in any of those three places, and there's no contradiction in any of those answers. It's just a way to refer to the same sort of area or region. This is the same kind of thing here. You've got the larger area, you've got a smaller area, and then you've got an exact village. It's referred to interchangeably because it means the same thing. That's what's happening. There doesn't need to be a debate. In fact, you can still go to uh, Gersa or Gerasa. Today it's called Kersi in, um, in the Holy Land, and it is. It's the other side of the Sea of Galilee. When he's in this area, Jesus, it's Gentile area. So it's an unclean area. He had been in Israel, but when he crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, gigantic lake, when he crossed over to the other side, now he's in Gentile territory. So it's what would be considered an unclean place. And that matters. And so verse 2, we'll begin to see why it matters. Verse 2, when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Now, I want to be clear what we're talking about. It says an unclean spirit. Now, there are some who think it just means it's a man with a bad attitude, like he's just, you know, he's got a meanness in him, or he's mean-spirited. That's not what's happening. This is a very specific reference. Unclean spirit means a demon. In fact, in the Greek, it's two terms, uh, akathartos and pneumos. And so akathartos Akathartos, you can hear cathartic in there. This mic is driving me nuts. Anybody else hearing that? Is it just me? All right. Can y'all still hear me? Okay, let's see how that goes. So, akathartos is unclean. Cathartic is in there. Cathartos, this is just like a word of cleansing, of cleanliness. When you put the A in front of it, it negates it. So, akathartos is unclean. Pneumos or pneumatos is a spirit. This is specifically referring to a demon. Now you remember, there's a lot of demons. Jesus is often uh, uh, shown to be removing demons from people. We saw it in Mark chapter one, very uh, first chapter when we began this study months ago. And in that chapter, I think it's around verse 24, Jesus confronts a man who's got a demon in him. The man self-identifies, the demon self-identifies, and Jesus casts the demon out. We begin to see it all through the gospel of Mark. I mean, we see it in chapter three a couple times. You see it not only specifically where Jesus is talking to one person that has a demon in them and casting the demon out. You even see it generally referred uh, where Mark, the writer, will uh, say, and he was casting out demons or he cast out many demons. You even see it at one point where Jesus gives his apostles authority to throw out demons. And then we see demons being removed from people uh, specifically throughout the rest of the book of Mark. Older people, younger people. In one incident, Jesus casts a demon out of a young girl. So this is a very prominent uh, event happening in the gospel of Mark. It's happening already. Verse two, when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Verse three, and he had his dwelling among the tombs and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. Now, here's what's interesting. Mark, in all of his writings and all of his stories and everything he writes, we see brevity, except here. 
Matthew talks about this event, and it's a lot less uh, verses, a lot more brief. Luke talks about it, it's a lot more brief. Mark talks about it, and he gives us this big, expansive account. All the other times that he talks about Jesus casting out a demon, it's nowhere near this much information. And so there's something in particular Mark is trying to get us to see in this one narrative that's like the most explicit of any time you ever see Jesus interacting with someone possessed by a demon. And so we start to go, okay, why is it that he's giving us so much detail? Well, already in verses 3 and three, four, and five, we see a lot of information that Mark is trying to get us to see. I mean, look at the description. It says he's dwelling among the tombs. That's important to know. Jesus has already gone into unclean area, the Gentile area. Jews weren't supposed to go into this unclean area. Uh, Now he's in a cemetery among the tombs. That's an even more unclean place where dead people are and dead bodies would be more unclean. Then we see a guy come up to him who's got a demon in him, uh, also more unclean. The Gentiles themselves are unclean. So all the uh, passage is showing us unclean people, unclean land, unclean location, a man with an unclean spirit. Normally, the people of Israel would have said had nothing to do with these people, their, their place, this location, and even that individual. And yet Jesus himself is strategically going straight there. You begin to get the impression That as Jesus left the people that he was talking to on the other side, the people of Israel, and he gets in a boat and crosses, that the whole reason he was doing this is just to go to this place specifically to meet this individual. And not just is it a place that's unclean, but keep on looking what it says. No one was able to bind him. They know that because they had been trying to bind him. They were trying to somehow shackle him, chain him, uh, lock him down. They wanted to restrain him. They didn't want him hurting anybody else. I mean, by using chains and shackles, it shows these people were really trying to keep him from hurting himself or others. In fact, the word that's used there, I believe in verse five, uh, no one could subdue him. That same verse or that same word is used in James chapter three, I think verse seven, where they're talking about taming a wild animal. That word for subdue is what you would use for a wild animal you're trying to control. I mean, this man was completely out of his mind. And if you even look in the other accounts of the writers who had written about this event, that becomes even more clear. This man was violent. Uh, He was angry. There's an evil there. He was constantly going and attacking people. In fact, it even says that no one could go anywhere near that cemetery where the tombs were because this man would come running out and physically attack them, try to kill them. Uh, If anyone pulled up in their boat and just got out on the shore, he would come running out to attack and beat and hurt them. I mean, he was violent. He was wicked. There was an evil there. And it's no different than how uh, we would see people decades ago if they had this kind of mindset. You see them. Uh, have a, a straight jacket put on them. You know what I'm talking about? Just to keep a person like this from being able to hurt themselves or others. Uh, today, what they do is less of the straight jacket and more of like some kind of drug, sedation, or whatever. It used to be they put them in a straight jacket, put them in a room that's like padded where they couldn't be hurt as easily or, or hurt someone else. Here they're using chains and shackles. And something about the demon that's in this man has given him some kind of supernatural strength where they're putting chains and shackles and he's breaking the chains and destroying the shackles. I mean, there's like a superhuman strength going on and a superhuman anger with superhuman violence. It's just a wicked scene. And the people of the village, whatever is going on with this man, they don't want him anywhere near them. So they've put him somewhere else. I mean, The image that Mark is giving us is this is a man that everyone else has walked away from. This is a man that they're saying, we don't want you coming anywhere near us. This is a man that they're saying, go and die somewhere else. In fact, there's such a wickedness there. I mean, I'm telling you, when I was reading this passage, I couldn't help but see myself in this. That this man who had become so violent, wicked, and just mean... And yet Jesus goes straight towards him. Everyone else is saying, we're keeping away from him. Jesus is saying, I want to go spend time with him. And so he does. I mean, in verse 5, constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs. You even get an idea that this man that has the demon in him, there's this inner turmoil that's happening. Like there's this awareness that he doesn't like what's happening to him, but yet he can't control it screaming in the mountains day and night. If you were to go to this town today, Kersey, uh, other side of the Sea of Galilee, it's in the area of Jordan. If you were to go there today, you can see where this cemetery was. 
uh, there's this like mountainside with these uh, tombs cut out of it, kind of like little caves. And so maybe he was taking one of those tombs and making it where he slept uh, or where he called home. Um, but you could go there and still see it. In fact, if you go there, there's about a mile down towards the water, there's this huge cliff that just has this steep drop off. So it's believed that's understood to be where it was. But speaking even of his own inner turmoil, it even says in verse five that he was gashing himself with stones. I mean, there was so much going on in this man and so much, uh, you know, I don't know, inner despair, sadness, fear, that he was even trying to kill himself, that he's taking stones from the mountain and just beating himself with it, just trying to die. These demons who were in him or the demon that's controlling or however it was working, They're so wicked and so mean that they're attacking anybody that comes near, attacking his village, probably attacking his family, and yet they wouldn't let him hurt himself, hurt everyone else, but not let him die. That's how bad it was. He was suicidal at this point. And you go, well, how does someone even get like this? This is how. So verse six, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. I mean, go back to verse 6, and we see something interesting happen. Jesus is approaching, and a man comes, this demon-possessed man comes running out. Verse 6, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. That word for bowed down before him is this word in the Greek that comes up a lot in the New Testament. It's this word proskuneo, and it most often is translated worship. The word proskuneo, kind of like prostrate, you hear it, proskuneo, and it usually means most literally to lay down flat, honestly, with your forehead to the ground. It was very common in ancient Persia for uh, two people who knew each other to, to do that, to kind of bow down. And if there was one person who was more inferior than the next, that person person would bow even lower, it soon came to be the word used for worship because the person would sometimes bow all the way. Sometimes they would get on one knee or both knees, sometimes forehead to the ground. And so we see this sort of event happening here. Uh, The man comes running out. It says in uh, uh, verse six, seeing Jesus from a distance. And then at the end of verse seven, uh, what business do we have with each other? Jesus, son of the most high God, the demons know who Jesus is. So the man runs out because the demons run out. The man bows down because the demons are bowing down and they know who he is. The reason they know who Jesus is is because they've known Jesus for thousands of years. And if you remember, all demons used to be angels in heaven. But at a point a long time ago when Satan rebelled against God, those who teamed up with Satan to rebel against God, God cast them out of heaven and they were brought to the earth as demons. So not only do do they know who Jesus is in this moment, they've known Jesus for thousands of years. And not only do they know Jesus and have known him for thousands of years, Jesus is the one that created them when they were angels. So of course they know who he is. And now because of their rebellion, as they've chosen sides with the devil and they're against God and against Jesus, they bow down before him. Because even the demons understand exactly that the authority and the, and the power that Jesus has. The previous passage was trying to make it so clear that Jesus is God. Only God can control the wind, the waves, the sea, and with the word or with the thought, make the storm calm. Now he's saying also Jesus has authority even over the devil and all the demons. So he ran up and he bowed down. He prostrated. He gets down on both knees. His head is bowed. And they say, what business do we have with each other, Jesus? What business do we have I mean, they're not just saying, hey, what brings you here? They have no misunderstanding that Jesus is there by accident. They know he's there on purpose. They know that there's work to be done. They also understand this because demons know their theology. Not only do they know that Jesus is the son of God, not only do they know that Jesus has authority and power, but they also understand what their future is. They know that there's a day in the future where Jesus is going to take all the demons of all the earth and throw them into the pit of hell. They know the day will come when Jesus will throw them into the lake of fire. 
Do they all know that? Yes. Do they all know that their days are numbered? Yes. Do they know Jesus has the authority with just a word to throw them into the lake of fire? Yes. Then why are they questioning him here? Because it's out of order. They know the day will come, but they think it will come way later. They know about the day when Jesus will come the second time and cast them into the lake of fire. And what's interesting is we learn this from Revelation chapter 20. But when this event is happening, Revelation hadn't even been written yet. So they understand the threat and promise and prophecy of their future torment and torture in the pit of hell. They know it before even the Apostle John has written it for the rest of us to understand. So they're like saying, what are you doing here? The time hasn't come. We're supposed to have another few thousand years. We're supposed to have a lot longer. You're in our territory. You're invading our area. This is Gentile territory. Why are you here? It's unclean. This is the area of Gentiles. Why are you here? They're unclean. This is the cemetery. Why are you here? It's unclean. This is the man we possess. Why are you here? He's unclean. Jesus, as a Jew, you shouldn't be here. And they're so upset with him. And yet, what do they do to him? They bow down. And they even beg. I implore you, verse 7, I implore you by God, do not torment me. Let me tell you what that verse actually means. I forgot to tell this to the first service. I just had everything else I was doing. But when it says don't torment me, they're begging not to torture them. That's the word torment is the word for torture. Now, they have no problem torturing and tormenting the man. They have no problem tormenting anyone else who comes near. They have no problem tormenting everyone that comes anywhere near the cemetery, and yet they, in their own hypocrisy, says, don't torment me. And what they say to him that's fascinating, it says here, I implore you by God. What they actually say to him is, swear to us by the name of God that you will not torture us. Swear to us. I mean, they don't go up and start a conversation. They know immediately when they see Jesus that this is not a friendly visit. There is hostility between us. I find it interesting too. No one could bind him. Chains could not hold him. Shackles couldn't arrest him and restrain him. They leave him alone in the mountains by the cemetery. No one could subdue him. And yet the presence of Jesus brings him to his knees. And there's something about Jesus entering your world that makes a difference. I mean, what we're beginning to see is what Jesus can do. What business do we have? They know their days are numbered. And they even say, Son of the Most High God. Isn't it fascinating? Demons know exactly who he is. Mark, when he started this letter, the very first chapter, the very first verse, the begin says this, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I've told you, the whole reason the gospel of Mark is written is to prove that he is the Son of God, and yet to this point, no human has confessed it. Now, he's healed people who were sick. He's healed people who had diseases. He's healed people who had a demon. And yet the people who he's healed have called him teacher. They've called him Lord. They've called him rabbi. But it's another demon? Only the demons call him son of God. Do not torment me. They're begging him. They're begging. And then verse 8, for he had been saying to them, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. Again, incredible detail that Mark is giving. Jesus is just saying to the man, to the demon, come out of him. Come out of him. And they're like, what business do we have? Come out of him. Why are you here? Come out of him. Swear to us you won't torture us. Come out of him. Tell me your name. And then his name is, he said to him, singular, he, one demon, says to Jesus, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now we're plural. What Mark is showing is that there's a lot of demons that have infested inside this man. There's a lot of demons who have somehow possessed him, and yet they have one who's like the spokesman, the spokesperson of all of them. 
And he's the one saying, my name is Legion for we're many. Legion isn't even an actual name. Legion is like a title or a designation. In the Roman army, a legion was 6,000 soldiers around about. Now, some say this means there were 6,000 demons in the man. Not necessarily, but we know there are at least 2,000 because in a little while when they go into the pigs, there's 2,000 pigs and all of them respond in the same way. So there's at least 2,000 here. What is Mark trying to get us to see? And this is it. Listen, more than once we see Jesus approach a person that has a demon in them and Jesus has authority over that demon. What Mark is pointing out here is in this example, Jesus isn't just confronting a demon. Jesus is going face to face with thousands of them. Jesus is confronting an entire army against himself. I've shared with you all before uh, the time that I was in Kenya, I don't know, almost 20 years ago, and we went to this area. Next thing we know, we got surrounded by the Kenyan army. It was me and this one other guy. I've shared the story with you before. The other guy that was with me, a friend, uh, he's a Brazilian man. He's the guy that said to me, run, right? We're surrounded by the Kenyan army. He wants me to run. And that's when I said back to him, where were we going to run, right? We're in Kenya, right? And so we freeze because the army's there. And there were probably... 50 soldiers with guns, right? All you do when that happens is whatever they tell you to do, right? You just freeze, right? Jesus has thousands of demons and they're bowing to him in fear. Verse 10, he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So the demon spokesman is begging Jesus not to send them out of the country. People have asked this question, like why do they not want to go out of that particular country of the Gerasenes? And the best answer is speculation. It it's, doesn't give us reasons, but there's speculation that Satan seems to assign demons a certain region of earth or a certain area of earth. That's all speculation, but verse 11 says, now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. Uh, again, further proof that this is Gentile territory. Uh, pigs are unclean. You're not allowed to eat pork. One of the things I don't like about the Old Testament, that pork is unclean. I love pork. They don't have anything to do with it. Thousands of pigs were there. Further evidence of the Gentile territory, the uncleanness. And they say, send us into the swine. Verse 12, the demons implored him, still begging him. The demons are begging him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Now, folks have asked before, why into the pigs? Why would the demons say, send us into the pigs? Well, I'm happy to tell you, I have no idea. I don't know why demons do some of the things they do. It doesn't tell us. But for some reason, they wanted to go into the pigs. Now, they're asking permission for that. They're begging. Verse 12, the demons implored, begged him, saying, send us into the swine that we may into them. And then verse 13, Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Now, notice this. Jesus didn't send them into the pigs. They asked permission. He gave them permission to go into the pigs. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down. They all just committed suicide all at the same time. All the pigs run into the water, and they all drown themselves. So folks have often asked this question, can demons inhabit an animal? And um, this proves, yes, the answer is yes. And this answers a question for me, because I'm con I hate roosters. So I'm convinced that <laughs> demons are in root. Who I've said it before, whoever ever first started saying that roosters crow when the sun comes up. They've never been around a rooster. Those stupid things crow all the time, all day, all night. They never shut up. I can't stand roosters. I hate them. Years ago, uh, and where I live, there's roosters all around us. So it's just like, oh. But I remember years ago, I was in Ghana doing mission work, and I had a team with me. They were all teenagers. Somehow they figured out I couldn't stand roosters because they're always just, just making the racket and keeping you awake, keeping me awake. And so this one time, uh, middle of the trip, I hadn't slept much in like several days, and I'm like, middle of the day, we had a few hours. I went and I laid down in a bunk bed in the hostel. Those teenagers thought it would be hilarious to capture a nearby rooster and stick it in the room and close the door where I was sound asleep. So uh, funny to them, terrifying to me. I can't stand those things. So the question comes up, okay, why would Jesus allow this? Why would he allow them to go into the 
pigs, right? And if he's got this kind of authority, why not just kill them, send them into the pit of fire, you know, then? That would have been 2,000 or more less demons than we have now. And the best answer, honestly, is just we don't know. Jesus, he has a reason for the demons. He's got a purpose or a plan even for those demons. And God's ways are above our ways. And there are people who, you know, we can say honestly that the demons are Satan's demons, but because Jesus has ultimate authority over them, it's almost as if they're his demons and they have to do what he says. And for some reason, he's allowed them to be here for another 2000 years from then to now. He must have some purpose for them that they don't realize they're fulfilling that ultimately leads to good. I mean, we know that when the end comes in Armageddon, according to Revelation, there's going to be this big showdown and they're all going to be cast into the lake of fire with Satan and Yet, at this point, he sends them into the pigs, and they all, they all take their own lives. And so, as I started thinking through what are reasons that Jesus would allow that, that he would allow them to go into the swine, and they would go and drown themselves, I, I thought of three reasons that I could see why this would be what Jesus would allow. And so, I just want to share them with you. One reason was to prove to those present that the demons had left the man, that Jesus himself had that authority and that this man now has no more demons in him. That was one reason, just proof. They all went into the pigs, the pigs went down and drowned. So that was one. Uh, A second reason I thought of is to show the destructive nature of demons, that all demons want to do is destroy. All demons want to do is kill. All they want to do is bring chaos and wreak havoc. So even when they're in the pigs, there's destruction. Even when they're in the pigs, there's just, you know self-harm, right? And then third, the third reason is to show everyone that Jesus, that he is the one that was prophesied to come, to show that he is the Messiah. And I thought about this one a lot, and it could almost sneak past us if we're reading it and not thinking, but do you remember all the way back in Genesis, and if you've not read it, let me just explain. In, in Genesis, it talks about uh, the Garden of Eden, when God created Adam and Eve and they were in the garden, and that's when creation was just the way God wanted it. Everything was just right. There was no sin. There was no anger, evil, death, anything like that. No disease. When the devil enters into the garden, Adam and Eve, by temptation, they sin. Well, God makes it really clear when he enters the garden later uh, that there's punishment, there's consequence for the sin that has come in. Uh, One of the things that you see God do. The, uh, Adam and Eve realize that they don't have any clothes on, so they cover themselves with leaves. God sacrifices an animal, takes the skin or the pelt of an animal, and covers them himself with what he has chosen. So again, it took sacrifice to cover over sin. And then the consequence of the sin is fascinating. One was, uh, for those of you who haven't read the passage, uh, there'd be increased pain in childbirth. That was part of the punishment that the woman would have to deal with uh, for sin. Another sin, or another consequence, was that the man would have to continue working, as he had already had been, but now the work wouldn't be so much pleasure. The work would be through the sweat of his brow and through pain and suffering. Uh, The earth, it said, would create or uh, now have thorns, thistles, and what this continues into is the ground, earth, would have not just thorns and thistles, but earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, all the storms that were not part of God's original creation, but it's a consequence of sin. Your sin affects everything around you, not just you, but even the world. Uh, But then also there was a consequence to the devil, where the devil had said that animal would slither and eat the dust. Well, God gives a prophecy in chapter 3, I think around verse 15, where he says the fruit or the seed of the devil would one day strike the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman would one day crush the head of the serpent, right? So there's this it's this prophetic language that the day would come when Satan would strike at the heel of Jesus, but Jesus, the Messiah, would crush the head of Satan. So whatever would be the case of the uh, who is the Messiah, we know certain things for certain. So when I go back and look at Jesus and why he came to earth, there are things that Jesus said that show us why he came here. In fact, in uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. That was one reason Jesus came. Another reason Jesus came, he said, I've come to set captives free, right? That's Luke chapter four, verse 18. 
Another verse, Jesus said, I came to testify to the truth. That's when he was debating with uh, Pontius Pilate. That's in John 18, 37. But there's another verse in 1 John 3, 8. And it says this, the son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. So all the way back in Genesis 3, it said the Messiah would crush the head of the devil. So whenever Messiah finally appears, he has to at least have a power or authority that he can wield over Satan and the demons. And then this verse even says that the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. These things are all true about Jesus, and he wants them to see. I don't just have authority over a demon. I can confront face-to-face an entire army of thousands of demons and still have complete authority and power over all of them. And it's a pretty powerful event. Verse 14 continues. When those pigs were thrown into the sea or ran into the sea, their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country. And the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Now look at what's happening here. He's sitting down, he's in his right mind, and it says he's clothed. That's because Matthew had reported that this man who was tormented had the legion in him, had been running around completely uh, undressed, and God, when Jesus enters this man's life, even clothing becomes part of it. It's just another thing to show uh, the importance of modesty and how we dress. Remember Adam and Eve, when sin entered, they realized they had no clothes on. Modesty is still an important concept in the eyes of God. And it says now he's sitting down in his right mind. I mean, I get the image of, in my mind of this guy sitting down at a coffee shop having a latte with his pinky out, just enjoying, hanging out. And they're seeing him and they're like, this is the guy. Now, you would think there'd be some kind of celebration, but it says they were frightened. And then there, verse 16, those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. You know what happens a lot? And maybe this is the case with some of you in here. I was told this recently as, recently as a month ago by someone that came up to me that said they were not a believer. And people say this all the time, and maybe some of you say this. They say, you know what? If I were there when a miracle happened, if I saw a miracle, then I would believe that Jesus is real. Then I would believe that there's a God. And people say that all the time. They say, well, if I lived back when Exodus happened and I saw all the miracles that the people of Israel saw during the Exodus, or if I was there during Jesus and saw dead people rise or a person healed right in front of me, then I would believe. People love to say that, but I can't tell you, it's just not true. It's just not true. If you see a miracle that happens right in front of you, there's no proof that you're going to suddenly have faith and believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Mark never uses miracles as evidence of someone's faith, and he never uses it as the reason for someone's faith. In fact, all that we see being used in the reason of miracles is to prove that he is who he says he is. But we never see somebody go, oh, well, since you did that, now I believe. Since you performed that miracle, now I want to get saved. Now you must be who you said you are. That's never what happens. But instead what happens is people get terrified. So what happens here in verse 15, look at the end of it. They saw the man sitting there. Everything is fine. He's wearing clothes. They become frightened. It's the same thing that happened with the apostles on the middle of the Sea of Galilee. He calms the storm. It said they were afraid of the storm because it was going to make the boat sink and they were all going to die. But when Jesus calmed the storm, they go from being afraid to very afraid. When they finally realize they're standing in the presence of God, they become terrified. And they began to, look at verse 17, they began to implore him to leave their region. Thank you. You've healed this man. You've cast out the demons. We now have 2,000 less demons in our village. Now get out of here. We don't want you here. These people were more comfortable with Satan being there than they were with God being there. And why is that? Men, why is it that people are more comfortable with the devil in their presence than they are with Christ in their presence? It's the same way today. They're angrier when they're aware of the presence of God. They get angry, they get scared, sometimes even violent. I mean, why is it that people would rather have the devil than they would have Jesus? I think people are okay with Satan because Satan's okay with your sin. They're fine with Satan. Satan doesn't tell people how to live, does he? Satan doesn't confront you with truth, does he? 
Satan lets you behave any way you want to behave. Satan gives you no protective limitations to sexuality. Satan gives you no guardrails for your mouth. He lets you choose any pronoun you want. You can choose any gender you prefer. You can sleep with anyone you want to sleep whenever you want to. Listen, Satan lets you do whatever you want to do, doesn't he? And when the world tries to give us a definition of the devil or of hell, they make it sound like Satan is the one you want to hang out with. Jesus is boring. Satan's the rock star. Hell is where the party is. Heaven is where nothing happens. And people are like, I want to be where the devil is. I want to be with the demons. I want to be where hell is, where all the fun things happen. Jesus, now, he sounds boring. The devil, he sounds fun. The angels, they sound boring. The demons, they sound great. So what the world wants to say is how they want to define it, but what we see in reality is something very different. And when demons are face-to-face with Jesus, they're silent. The demons want you to rebel. Meanwhile, they bow down. They want you to ignore God. Meanwhile, they're terrified of him. They want you to mock God's word, and yet they beg him for mercy. They want you to think he doesn't exist. While they call him the son of the most high God. They've got the world fooled. And it continues, verse 18, as he was getting into the boat, he's leaving. He left the people of Israel. He goes into the area of the Gentiles and he heals the man. He gets back in his boat and goes right back across. As Jesus was getting into the boat, verse 18, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. Take me with you. Let me go with you. I mean, we're seeing a picture of salvation and discipleship. And this is what happens when you allow Christ to come into your life. It's so different than just saying, I know who he is, or I've read who he is, or I've understood and learned who he is. There's a major difference between having the knowledge of who he is and allowing him to enter your life. And some of you have heard my story. I, I, see, I see me in this. And the folks that I grew up with and the people I went to school with, when people today say, did you hear Brian became a Christian? They think it's a joke. They go, no, 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 he's in ministry. And they laugh out loud. They say, no, no, he pastors a church. They think you're nuts. But you understand that's what happens when you allow Christ to have authority in your life. You want evidence of faith. What you want is evidence of obedience. Jesus is getting in the boat to go back across because they're kicking him out of their area. And he says, let me go with you. Verse 19, he did not let him, but he said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him and everyone was amazed. Decapolis isn't even the name of a city. Decapolis is two words or it's a compound word in the Greek. It just means 10 cities. So he went to 10 cities, this whole region, and he's just telling people about Christ. He's just like, I mean, this guy hadn't been to Bible college. This guy hadn't been to seminary. All that guy had was the demon taken out of him, and he's going around as this grand evangelist like Billy Graham through the whole region telling them about what Jesus has done for him. No training, no certification, no program. Just let me tell you what Christ has done for me is what he's doing. We even see a place where Jesus later comes back and they know who he is. How would they know who he is? This man's been telling them. You say, man, why do we have these passages? Why did the Spirit of God, through the hand of Mark, give us the story of Jesus calming the storm and the story of him having authority over darkness and Satan and the demons? And here's the reason why. So that you can begin to look back and say, man, look at what Christ has done in my life. And look at the mercy that he has shown me. I mean, the man here that Jesus chose to help, the man was a monster. He was wicked. He was mean. He was hateful. He was murderous. He was even trying to kill himself. And Jesus comes to his life and makes this dramatic difference. Here's Here's the point to take away. Why would Jesus go to such a monstrous individual in such an unclean area? Here's the answer. The same reason Jesus would come to you. Because he knows you. He cares about you. And Jesus sees more in you than you usually see in yourself. 
Everyone else was saying, avoid the man. Let him go out and die in the mountains. Jesus is like, no, I care about him. So what do we take with this passage? Here's one. Jesus is the son of God. Here's another one. Jesus destroys the works of the devil. And here's another one. Jesus is pursuing you. Okay? You pray with me? Father, we love you. We love you, we love you, we love you. And God, it is so great to be jolted into a moment where we're reminded who you are. God, we know the demons lie. All they want to do is lead us to death. The devil doesn't care. He doesn't care how we live. He just wants us dead. And he wants us dead because he hates you and you love us. So he hates us. He hates what you love, God. But God, it's, it's great to be reminded how much you care about us and to be reminded about the, the real power of the gospel. To be reminded of who your son Jesus really is and why he came and God, he has set so many of us free. Father, I know there's someone here today that is not free. And they're loaded down with stress and anxiety and fear. And God, they come here to hear a word from you. And today they've been reminded how much you care about them. That no matter what they've done, no matter how deep they've gone, that you care about them. You love them. And if they would just allow you, that you could change their life. So, Father, we saw two young men baptized a moment ago. You're still at work. And we know that you're at work right now in the hearts of those here. So church, while your eyes are closed, your head is bowed, it may be that you know God is pursuing you. And in this moment, I just want you to know that here in a moment, we're going to sing, we're going to stand, there's going to be another song. And that time is for you. It's to give you an opportunity to come forward and say, I just want to talk to someone about what's going on in my life. You can say it like that. You can say, I want to talk to someone about God or I have questions about Christ. You can say any of those things. Maybe you know full well it's time that you join the church or talk to someone about baptism. So we give this time for you to respond. And we see it all through the New Testament. We see the apostles deliver a message and then call for people to make a decision for Christ. We see people hear the story of what Christ has done and then they're told to now choose and to respond. So just like has been happening for 2,000 years, it's happening today. And you know Christ is pursuing you. And so we give you an opportunity, an invitation to respond. And so in a moment, after I say amen, the song starts, you'll see people down front, just walk up, talk to them. It might be that you just want to take a moment and just pray, and the altar will be open. You can walk up. People do it all the time. And just come up and have a moment in prayer. You can even ask somebody to go with you. You can go to the front. There's stairs on either side. Just have a moment in prayer in response to what you sense God is doing in your life, but don't just do nothing. Father, we're grateful for this moment where you're forcing us, you're forcing us to look inward, and be honest with who we really are. And you're forcing us to look up and be honest with who we know you are. So God, I pray for those who are aware of your pursuit of them, that they would respond today. And we ask that in Jesus' name.
Amen. Pastor Brian has given us some great takeaways. Be sure to take some time to reflect on all the things we've learned and how we can apply those teachings to our lives. If by chance you prayed that prayer during the invitation for the first time, we want to congratulate you and welcome you to God's family. That's a really big deal to us and we want to celebrate by connecting with you. Let us know you made that decision by clicking on the I made a decision link in the chat and we'll be able to connect with you on a personal level and walk you through our next steps. We want to thank you for being with us. We love you and we look forward to seeing you next week.